Today we're going to talk about Ghislaine Maxwell. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? These clips come from the Jeremy Kyle show on Talk TV, her only in prison interview. Everyone was always asking, who is the real G? Who's the real Ghislaine? Well, I think the best people to answer that is probably the people who were closest to me, like you. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely not the person portrait. I feel completely divorced from the person that people reference and talk about in the and all the various newspaper articles and TV shows and podcasts. And so the biggest misconception of you? That I'm the cruelest, meanest, horriblest person who's done committed crimes. All right, Chase, what do you got? So right here, she immediately wants to ensure that the audience is aware she is associated with this interviewer. So she must be a good person if we respect the interviewer. So she must not be that bad. And you can see this immediately when she says, people who are close to me like you. There is a super obvious confirmation request or agreement request here. And her nervous behavior just spikes as she kind of stares at the screen for this hint of confirmation there. And she's uh, feeling divorced from a character portrayal implies that it did, in fact, exist. So this statement is far away from anything saying that's not me at all. That's not saying that at all. So I think she's accidentally revealing how her psychology works here. She describes this kind of caricature of her drawn by media as cruelest, meanest, horriblest person. And in her mind, I think she disagrees with this. And I think this is honest. And she was probably kind and polite while she was recruiting these very, very young girls. And I think the character description is what she's so disgusted by. I think she reassures herself about the crimes by justifying that she was nice and polite and kind to them while doing so. Scott? All right. We finally hear what her, how her name is supposed to be pronounced, Ghislaine, because I was always calling her Ghislaine and Ghislaine and all these other names, I'm sure, as everyone has. So I thought that was really interesting. I thought that was almost a relief to find out that's her how her name is pronounced. And when she says, like you're saying, Chase, when she says the people closest to me like you, she start. that's when we see this grooming, these grooming gestures start because she's she's used to being way up on the social totem pole. But now she's way down and she knows this guy. I believe it's her brother, if if I'm correct. Uh, so they're very, fair, fairly tight, I'm sure. And he understands what kind of person she is. And then when he said, who is the real Ghislaine? She laughs and she smiles. And when she has, when she smiles real big, she starts flushing out. She starts getting red. And this thing called the super trochlear vein, which is, which comes down right here. You'll see two of them. There are, there are two of them. There's a super trochlear vein and the super ocular vein that comes this way. But when those pop out like that, that means your blood pressure has gone up a little bit. That's what makes them quite often, not every time, but that's one of the main reasons that it, it bulges. So this is an embarrassing thing for her, I think, because he asks her that sort of puts her on the spot. I guess they thought for an interview that should that need to be one of the questions asked because she could sort of defend herself. But I think she's embarrassed by that. That's why I see her blood pressure go up and she flushes. Um, okay, I'll end it there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, here's one of the few times I think we're going to see real her in this entire video. And I think what, when I say we see real her, there's a whole lot of hiding going to. And when you say she's a different person here, I think a lot of the grooming we're going to see is associated with she's usually immaculately groomed. You know, somebody has spent a lot of money on her hair and that kind of thing. And now she doesn't have that luxury. She does have a makeup, they said in the in the thing. But clearly she's not herself. So she should be keenly aware of her of her appearance at all times. We'll, we'll see a lot of that. I, my notes say apparently I don't travel in the right circles because I'm not G or H or M. She's G here. So apparently that's what the cool kids are all called today is by their initial. This is her brother, and she's deferential in this response to him. And when I say I think we see her, I think we see that coy personality that she uses has been her strength because she tucks her chin, looks from under her brow. She does smile. She moves her hair back, and she she's in that kind of coy, drawing a person in behavior. My guess is that's how she deals with people on a regular basis. 
before she got into this place. And so we see a little bit of residual from who she was. She adapts with her palm against her face and she fluffs her plumage. And I think that's because she's keenly aware of her appearance and it's not what she usually had. So this is one of those cases where we're going to talk a lot about adapters and self-grooming. This is both, I think, in this case. She puts her hand to her face and moves her hair in the adapting and in the self-grooming because she's keenly aware. She can navigate on what to say, and she even halts when she's talk, saying, I'm not the person. We see this taste in her mouth as she draws the sides of her mouth back, and she outright throat protects as she addresses the newspapers. When she's saying this newspaper thing, I think it's part of her baseline and awareness that she's you know, not herself when she's in front of a camera. When she does that horriblest, I'm not the cruelest, horriblest person who has committed crimes, that's a really awkward set of words compared to everything else we hear her say. Maybe you're not the cruelest, horriblest, but you might be one of the more cruel and more horrible. So careful how you use words in this case. But her forehead comes up in uncharacteristic fashion at request for approval when she says that. She's asking you to believe her. And this is a whole new frame of reference for her. And this is probably going to be one of the more positive ones we see. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is in her her brother, um, who th th uh, nine siblings. Uh, if if one of my siblings said, hey, you know, you're one of the people that knows me most, you might see a reaction on my face. You might see delight or recognition of that. With Ian, you see nothing happening in his face. He doesn't respond to that idea of him knowing her best. He has a history with some of his family members of them getting in trouble with the law, including himself, him and his brother being left to carry the can of his uh, father's fraudulent work with, with British pensions. So does he know his sister? Does he really, has he ever really known his family? Did he really know his father, an international man of mystery, pretty much? So I think the question of does anybody know the real G is potentially a real question from him. There's a little bit of a wry smile on his face there and a non-reaction to her saying, well, you know me best. I don't think he does know her best at all. And he's really questioning who his sister is. He was supportive before she got convicted and went into prison. Is he still supportive now? Why is he there? to do this interview other than he's probably one of the people who can get her to talk. Interesting. There, everyone was always asking, who is the real G? Who's the real Ghislaine? What else? I think the best people to answer that is probably the people who were closest to me, like you. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely not the person portrayed. I feel completely divorced from the person that people reference and talk about in the and all the various newspaper articles and tv shows and podcasts and so the biggest misconception of you that i'm the cruelest meanest horriblest person who's done committed crimes during that call maxwell told our interviewers and her brother kevin who was also mm. present that she's suffering from depression, having lost everything. She claimed to be keeping her spirits up by working every day on her appeal. And she revealed intimate details of how this one-time socialite is dealing with daily prison life. So they wake you up at six. And you can go to breakfast, which consists of a cereal and a fruit, a piece of fruit, generally. And then you have to make your bed sort of military style. And so there's nothing that's sticking out or whatever. It has to be a prescribed way, otherwise you can, to travel, you can get what's called a shot. And then at 7.30, you go to work, and for me, that means I go, go to the law library uh, to help people. So they have detainers, or they have warrants, or they're trying to appeal their case, and uh, let's see, get a compassionate release, 
or they ask about the First Step Act and how credits are applied to their time, that sort of thing. And I answer those types of questions. I also help people file out their administrative remedies. Um, and that is until 10 o'clock when they then, you have to come back uh, and they call lunch is around 10.30. If you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. We're the top four body language experts in the world. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military, published the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, and I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a great example of from in charge to incarcerated, what happens and everything changes, everything about your psyche changes. One of the things we know about psychology of capture is that everything becomes all about you. Nothing else matters. What happens to other people doesn't matter. And every decision becomes black and white. And that's what we're seeing here. And we're starting to see her. She's talking about her normal life. We get a good baseline and all this touching and feeling and adjusting is probably a combination of the things I said earlier. Some of it's self-grooming because look, when you fall from a height, you want to be perceived as still having some of that personality, but most of it's gone. People like this have space around them. I often say I have a Darth Vader costume around me because of what we do. I mean, people are afraid of us. People, we have our own air about us. The minute you get locked up, all that stuff goes away. Your toy box gets turned upside down. And so a lot of this adapting could be her trying to be keenly aware of her appearance, keeping her hair fluffed, that kind of stuff, as well as feeling awkward in front of someone she knows, more than someone she knows, and keenly aware that she's in front of the world and she's going to file an appeal. So she has to be very careful which word she says. You see some really good visual accessing cues. We always talk about accessing people go to a place in their head. You ask her cues about what she does and her eyes are going to the same place consistently. So we would think that's a visual accessing cue for her. Um, the people who are interviewing our friends and you see a genuine smile when she first starts off. And then I think all this is appearance, all this constant touching that makes you kind of crazy. Even her face touching, I think, is somewhat related to that, but it's also related to how she's being perceived. So self-grooming can be about perception and adapting at the same time. The one place that's really interesting is when she talks about foods, see her teeth exposed, sides of her mouth up and her nose wrinkled. There's some disgust. Look, there's not a whole lot here. This is just a great baseline for the rest of it because there's so much going on. It's tough not to notice. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so like you said, her grooming and hygienic gestures are off the charts here. And grooming refers to behaviors that are intended to modify or improve somebody's physical appearance. The facial touching behaviors here have been noted in 60, 70 behavioral studies here. And it's shown to be the most common behavior displayed in studying subjects during deliberate deception. With a giant caveat here, I will say that is in an academic, sterile environment and setting. It's still a, a pretty good, reliable indicator of stress if you see this when someone doesn't regularly perform this behavior. Then we have hushing, which is any behavior that covers the mouth like this. And Barbara and Alan Pease coined uh, this term. So when a person brings their hand to their face in a way that also covers their mouth, this is also a high stress indicator when it's compared to a baseline or someone's normal behavior. But something is off here. Her baseline, uh, when she's been seen in other stuff, has, has none of these behaviors. So when we look at information context, she's offering information at low stakes Probably truthful, not likely to be deceptive. So the stress behavior is probably more about appearance. So, Greg, I agree with you. Just a different angle. Uh, Mark. 
Yeah, yeah, agreed. Look, the the adapters and the self soothing is absolutely off the charts. It's erratic as well. Nothing completes. You'll move on to one thing and another thing and another thing. I would put that down to the stress of incarceration, potentially depression as well. Just just nothing is functioning as as it would normally function. Maybe the stress of being there. There's a lot of looking up to one corner as well. I think that might be about where the entrance to that area is and maybe other people coming in and out i can't guarantee that but 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 there so does seem to be often some disturbance off to to the side or some you know minor threat off to the side um look the main thing about about this you're absolutely right greg it, it is all about her but here's the vocabulary she uses you instead of i or we so she's already positioning herself away from anything that's bad about being in the prison. And understand, she knows grammar. She went to Oxford. She was at Balliol College. I don't think you actually pronounce it like that. Uh, but those that were there will know exactly how to pronounce it. Like those that know uh, Ghislaine will know how to pronounce that rather than Ghislaine. So, you know, if you went to Balliol and Oxford, put down below exactly how I should be pronouncing that. Um, until so it's all about you you do this you get up you eat okay not i and we until she says i also uh, i work in the library i also help people the moment it's positive and about her positive image she goes to an i and not to a a uh, a you um you know she could easily say throughout that i we or even one one gets up in the morning one eats uh, would be good uh, grammar. There, that's all I've got on that one. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with you guys. This is a classic fish out of water story because she's come from the highest heights of the social, of, of social status down to the lowest lows. Um, I think she's, she's showing all these grooming gestures. You guys are at him just sort of repeating what you, what you talked about. I think she feels like she stands out. So she's trying even more to, uh, to stand out less how you say that grammatically correct. I think she's really trying not to. That's why she's so embarrassed because when she when she first comes in, I think her hair is up. So she lets it down and starts goofing with it. So she'll try to regain some of that, the look she had when she before she went into prison because right now compared to the way she used to look, she looks like a hoarder or something. I'm sure it's from living that way, not being able to, to do all the treatments you usually do on that level of, of, of status, Mark, that she had earlier. Um, she props her head up with her hand and she starts goofing around with her hair again. I think this thing here is sort of her comfort spot. That's where she's, she, we see all of her adapters coming from this little area. That's all there is we can see, but she seems to be squished in there doing that. So she's bringing her arms in, keeping them close to her chest. That probably makes her feel a bit better. And these repetitive behaviors we're seeing, we understand those to be pacifying behaviors from what Joe Navarro uh, talks about. So anything we do that's repetitive is something that helps us calm us down and get rid of that built up stress or tension. Uh, again, I think this is a, a great fish out of water um, example, uh, going from the highest to the lowest in the world of status. During that call, Maxwell told our interviewers and her brother Kevin, who was also present, that she's suffering from depression, having lost everything. She claimed to be keeping her spirits up by working every day on her appeal. And she revealed intimate details of how this one-time socialite is dealing with daily prison life. So they wake you up at six and you can go to breakfast, which consists of a cereal and a fruit, a piece of fruit, generally. And then you have to make your bed sort of military style. And so there's nothing that's sticking out or whatever. It has to be a prescribed way, otherwise you can, to travel, you can get what's called a shot. And then at 7.30, you go to work. And for me, that means I go, go to the law library uh, to help people so they have detainers or they have warrants or they're trying to appeal their case and uh, let's see get a compassionate release 
or they ask about the First Step Act and how credits are applied to their time, that sort of thing, and I answer those types of questions. I also help people file out their administrative remedy. Um, and that is until 10 o'clock, when they then, you have to come back uh, and they call lunch. is around 10.30. The portion control is very odd. And then because I'm uh, on a no meat diet, they're supposed to have either hummus or cottage cheese or um, tofu for you, but mostly, I'd say, about 95% of it. It's tofu if it's anything, or, or beans. It's, and I'd say 95% of it's, it's, it's beans, and then otherwise you have like a tofu substitute. And in the tofu has no season, there's no seasoning allowed, so there's no salt or pepper or anything. So it's, it's, Bland as it's beyond t t tasteless. And then you go back to work at 12. And that lasts until 3.30 when you come back and you have a, a stand-up head count at 4. And if you are lucky, they call recreation at some point during the day. If you're at work, you miss it. And if you're not, you get to go out for an hour. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm on a no-meat diet. That would be I'm a vegetarian for, for, for everybody else. But I'm on a no-meat diet, again, is saying, like, look at me. Look how wonderful I am. I don't eat meat. But you, you get tofu. You get, So, again, the moment it, become, it becomes bad, it's all about you have to do this, you have to do that. The moment there's some, some high status in it, uh, Scott, the moment there is some sense of moral goodness, it's all about I, I do this. And we'll see this throughout as we have before. Um, the, we're seeing this um, eye rub uh, as well, which th that'll start to redden over time as well. So these uh, adapters and pacifiers, as Scott was rightly, rightly saying, they are going to become so frequent that you'll start to see damage happening to the to the skin tone uh, and therefore again that's why i would put this in the class of this is probably about incarceration because if you can cause some kind of self-harm in some way or you be the cause of irritation or pain it means that they're not the cause of the irritation of the pain you have some some control over yourself so some extreme uh, pacifying behaviors what's interesting as well just the banality and the mundanity of, of what she's talking about uh here it is it is utterly uh mundane that's that's prison don't go there don't <laughs> don't whatever you can do to avoid that you should be avoiding that uh, greg what do you got on this one yeah, a couple of things. I always say that adapters, like Joe talks about it being comforting. I make, I say it makes familiar the unfamiliar. So if I put you in a cage and you start doing the same thing over and over and over, it becomes familiar. Whatever that thing is, and it can be all kinds of weird things. If you've ever been around prisoners, they pick up lots of weird things. The other one is the pronoun shift, Mark. I had it in my notes as well. And I run into it all the time in corporate world. Um, the person who is a narcissist and who has a team of people who bust their ass to get things done says I, I, I when things go well and we, we, we when things go poorly. You see it every day in your corporate life. Those are narcissistic tendencies in people. So they want to take it, take um, the credit for it. Only a couple of things really other than that to, to, to push here. One is her baseline kind of stabilizes at the beginning. She starts to not adapt as much. Where she is adapting, where she is adapting is when she's describing the food. And you have to wonder why, because that should be a thing you just puke up and say, look, I eat tofu 90% of the time or me, but she doesn't. She's careful and she's navigating. She's adapting more than normal right there. I wonder if she's afraid of how that will be perceived by people that feed her. Remember your caretakers and Mark, you say it all the time. We defer to those who own resource. And so we see a lot of that. And I also will go back to, she's fallen from a great height. She had a ton of 
stuff going on in her world. She probably didn't have to adapt much. She would just be poised and quiet and do that coy thing when she was talking to normal people. But when you go to prison, to your point, Mark, everything changes. Nothing's good. When your big to do is to talk about going to the library and eating tofu, your day is pretty mundane. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And I agree with you at the first, it's kind of calm. But then she, when she starts talking about the food, this apparently is a big deal for her because that's when she starts moving around. She moves around so much and squirms around so much. It's like a 1980s Times Square crack tweaker. She can't, she can't sit still. She's just moving around and just looks weird. But this is normal for a situation like that. Again, coming out of, of where she came from, from that, from her higher status down to this lower one. That's and right now this is the highest I'm sure she's felt on that level in a long time because all the attention is on her. She knows everybody's going to be watching her. She knows there's interest in her. The reason for the interest is not good, but still she's getting that validation of attention that that personality type needs. So I, that's another reason going back to which we see the whole pretty much the whole time, uh, the grooming, the 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 trying to look cute, the trying to look because she hasn't been she hasn't been pretty in a long time or what she would consider that because she she's not having anybody do her hair obviously it's as long as it's ever been the pictures i've seen of her and i i think this is a real uh psychological situation she hasn't been in if she ever has been um it, it's a tough one for us so i think that's why we're seeing so much movement and so many adapters and we're seeing psychological upset chase what do you got yeah, so there's a lot of the same self-touching, self-soothing behavior here. We're still seeing the stress spike with these, and her blink rate's really high. And we use blink rate, which is how often you blink. Uh, the more often you blink, the more stressed you are. There's some exceptions to that, like dry eyes and things like that. But on, on another note, she has a problem being observed when she cannot control her appearance. We saw this in court when the court artist was sketching her and she stared them down and sketched them back. So she drew a picture of the court artist sketching her. So we know there's a problem with being observed here. And I think that's what we're seeing. One thing uh, we can take away from this for future analysis is her eye home. And this means where she normally looks to recall truthful information. So from this video, when she's recalling places and activities, she has a very strong tendency to look at her or our one o'clock. So at one o'clock, uh, if you were looking at the clock, and this is up and to her left, this one behavior is so critical to know that if an interview ever happens in the future, you would be able to see a deviation from this during critical questions about places and activities. So keep that in mind. Where does somebody normally look? to access truthful stuff that you know is most likely true. And then look for that a little bit later in the conversation. The portion control is very odd. And then because I'm uh, on a no meat diet, they're supposed to have either hummus or cottage cheese or um, tofu for you. But mostly, I'd say about 95% of it's tofu if it's anything, or, or beans. It's, and I'd say 95% of it, it's, it's beans, and then otherwise you have like a tofu substitute. And then the tofu has no season, there's no seasoning allowed, so there's no salt or pepper or anything. So it's, it's, it's beyond t t tasteless. And then you go back to work at 12, and that lasts until 3.30 when you come back and you have a, a stand-up head count at four. And if you are lucky, they call recreation at some point during the day. If you're at work, you miss it. And if you're not, you get to go out for an hour. I believe that he was... Uh, murdered. Well, I was shocked. And I wondered how it had happened. Because um, as far as I was concerned, he was going to... I was sure he was going to appeal. And I was sure that he was covered under the non-prosecution agreement. But I wasn't in the indictment. 
So I wasn't mentioned. I, wa I wasn't even one of the co conspirators. I obviously wish I'd never met him. You know, looking back now, I probably wish I had stayed at, in England. But leaving that aside, you know, I tried to leave and start a new job and move on from the end of 98, 99. So I wish that I had been more successful at moving on. Because I became a banker, so I should have, you know, moved on completely. At the time, I wouldn't have had a problem introducing people to my friends, to him, because I didn't know that he was so awful. I mean, obviously now, looking back with hindsight, of course, but at the time... I mean, he had lots of friends. I mean, he was friendly with just about everybody you can imagine. There was no reason to imagine that he was someone of interest to people. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so she starts off with a usual high level of adapting, which is, I think, baseline for prisoner Gillen. I don't think it's baseline for her normal. I think poised and calm is her normal, but, but now she's lost all that. She has some halting language as she gets up to murdered. That could be because she's concerned about how this is going to be perceived, all kinds of things. Remember, she's preparing for an appeal as well. So how that's how that is perceived is important. Well, she should pay more attention to other things. She goes to a new adapter when she says that. She rubs at these muscles in the middle of your forehead that show concern or grief and tighten. That's an interesting one for her to do. We don't see other times. Her voice intonation lilts and sounds almost if it cracks or weak or it's weak when she says how it happened. So I do believe she's surprised how that happened. Maybe she's got some fear about it. Who knows? And then her adapting goes away. All this adapting stops. And then she gets to this point where she comes to a halt and she's talking about covered under appeal and non-prosecution and her brow rises. That's an interesting place that all this stuff she's been doing disappears. Now I want to know a lot. I want to know a lot more why that happened. Her blink rate goes through the roof. And then she starts to slice herself off from him by saying, I wasn't a co-conspirator. The only remorse we've seen to now is her wishing she hadn't met him. That's the only thing we've seen. And I don't think we're going to see much more remorse as we go through these. I found two places. Listen to that convoluted BS around what he was. And then her voice intonation go to lilt again, saying, I didn't know he was that awful. There's a, a voice intonation left. And then she did. This is some of the most severity softening language I've ever heard in my entire life when she says, didn't know he was of interest to people. Is she hiding something bigger than the stuff we know has happened? Maybe there's more to all that. Maybe all that's been conjectured is true. Don't know. This sounds like I'm sorry I didn't that we got caught or sorry that you feel that way. When somebody hurts you and then tells you, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry we got caught. That's what I see here. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah. The, the biggest spike in blink rate, which we know is a, a stress indicator here, is right at he was murdered. And this might not indicate deception here. This is stress, which we know was blink rate. And it might be associated with making this statement publicly or the thought of him being murdered. And with no other real behaviors here to add to a cluster, I would say this is not deception. This reddening of her face that you see down here occurs right at the moment she's trying to convey that she didn't know he was a bad guy. I think this whole entire statement got her worked up. And I think she experienced like a full body flush that caused it was so bad that it caused itching even in her legs. And she reaches up and touches her face after that. And you can see that at the end of this where she's saying there's no reason to imagine uh, he's of interest to people. She looks at our nine o'clock very quickly and then corrects herself back to looking at her normal position, which is the, the one o'clock eye movement. I think there's a chance she had a very skilled and very expensive trial coach. And I think those skills uh, are a bit rusty, in my opinion. I think she had training on how 
to persuade a jury from somebody who had some tremendous persuasion skill. Mark? Uh, because I became a banker and we've got that elongation of the vowel there and, and that kind of transmutation of the of the vowel to a to a longer a higher vowel rather than a a, a rounder vowel so she and, and we get an eyebrow raise on that as well a look for approval so she really wants us to know that um you know she she was moving her life on to being something really important a banker not like you don't get many of those around this way like if I threw a bread roll out of my window right now, I would probably hit the, the heads of three of them right now. But in her in her world, that's like wow, you know, I was a banker, so that's really important, really good, and and I want you to know that I was that. So um, now I think we get a, a definite blocking of the mouth on. He had lots of friends, so I think there is a suppression there of the names of those people and she leaves it to our imagination just about everyone you can imagine well that would be everybody that i can imagine and i know that within the set of everybody i can imagine i know most of them have not met jeffrey epstein so what i need to know is what are the names of the people that you are talking about and that's what she won't give at this point and i think that's what that definite mouth block is around. She's not giving over those names, which I think is significant. Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, at first, Chase, I couldn't tell if it was because of the video quality or what was happening. But as we go through that video, you can see she begins to look a more flush, her cheeks get flush, and she even starts the scratching. Up to this point, all of her illustrators, all, all of her adapters have been um, up here around around her hair and those type. Now it's all almost exclusively to her face. So this is odd as well. And I think it's because of the emotional situation going on here. I think maybe she might have been in love with this guy. You know, maybe that's that's the problem. So that but she doesn't want to show that. So she's trying to eat lock down even further so things start coming in. But I think that's another reason she's goofing off with her face all all over the place because she's um trying to hold that stress in. Um in the first two videos, we saw a whole lot of, of like I said before, a whole lot of, of, of hair stuff. Almost nothing here with it. I think she pulls her hair behind her ear or something. But I think you guys have covered everything on this. But uh, I, th I think she might have, maybe she was in love with him. I think that's probably what I would take from this, the way she's approaching this. Being guarded in all the ways you've got to be guarded during that because of the subject matter. I think we're actually seeing her emotion, uh, a true emotion coming through on this. All right, we good? Yeah. Oh, Mark. Yeah, man. See? Yeah, hands That's what down. Happens. That's what happens. It's very British of you. <laughs> I believe that he was uh, murdered. Well, I was shocked. And I wondered how it had happened. Because um, as far as I was concerned, he was going to... I was sure he was going to appeal, and I was sure that he was covered under the non-prosecution agreement. But I wasn't in the indictment. So I wasn't mentioned, I, was, I wasn't even one of the co-conspirators. I obviously wish I'd never met him. You know, looking back now, I probably wish I had stayed at, in England. But leaving that aside, you know, I tried to leave and start another new job and move on from the end of 98, 99. So I wish that I had been more successful at moving on because I became a banker. So I should have you know, moved on completely. At the time, I wouldn't have had a problem introducing people to my friends to him because I didn't know <laughs> that he was so awful. I mean, obviously now, looking back with hindsight, of course, but at the time, I mean, he had lots of friends. I mean, he was friendly with 
just about everybody you can imagine. There was no reason to imagine that he was someone of interest to people. Well, it's a fake. I don't believe that. I don't believe it's real for a second. In fact, I'm sure it's not. There's never been an original. And further, there's no photograph. And I've only ever seen a photocopy of it. I don't believe it happened. And um, it's certainly the way as described would have been impossible. I don't have any memory of going to Tramp. Uh, certainly not in the outfit that I would have worn. Um, oh, her stories have changed so many times about what happens, when it happens, how it happens, with different versions. And each time she speaks, there's a different version. In fact, if you look at her BBC interview on the panorama, um, I believe she says that he, or I can't remember, either he or... Yeah, she that he puked on her face. That's the only time she's ever said that. All right, Chase, what do you got? This is a masterclass in couching and softening statements. And just consider the difference between a couple of these. I don't believe it's real. And that photo is, is not real. She says, I don't believe it happened. She didn't say it did not happen. She says, I don't have any memory of going to Trump. She doesn't say, I did not go to Trump. These are giant Tramp. red flags. Tramp. Tramp. Sorry. Uh, dr- giant red flags for any interviewer. This is the point where we might suggest deception is occurring here and ask some more probing questions. But this is also a master class in internal dialogue eye movement. So Ghislaine's recalling what she read, what she heard in the interview and how the words sounded to her. And you can see it when her eyes move down and to her left. She's recalling what the accuser has said in these interviewers. So it's it's not only is this a regular place we look for internal dialogue, we also know it's where she accesses or moves her eyes for internal dialogue. So this is an example of how all four of us collect this behavioral data about someone's normal behavior before we transition to harder questions. Scott? All right. I agree with you. All the adapting has moved to her hands. Looks like she's in a palm olive commercial or something because she can't jerk and she can't leave her hands alone. We don't see any hair grooming, no mouth touching. Everything has everything has changed. I can't wait to hear Greg because I know it's just a complete baseline. She just said, there's that. Now let's go over here. I'm going to start acting like this. Everything has changed. Even her face looks different. Uh, the whole thing is, is, is taking a different look on. So I think we're seeing dang near uh, 100% deception in all this. Not 100%, but we sure are seeing a lot of deception. Uh, but that's because she's a professional liar and that she's good at it. She's had to do it for what she's done in her background. She's had to be a liar. She's had to be good at it. So now her focus is based on her and her thoughts about Epstein. I mean, that's what we've been, it's been based on at this point, but now it's on a focus that contradicts that photo. So everything she's talking about has to say that photo isn't real because she's got a lot riding on that. I'm no Photoshop expert, but boy, it sure looks real to me. I mean, it, it looks, it's, and everybody I've talked to and everyone that's seen it said, yeah, that, that looks pretty real. People I know who are really good at Photoshop, professionals, they said, no, that, that looks real. But they said it looks real. Nobody can, you can't say 100% it is or 100% it isn't, but I think she's telling us 100% it isn't. Her st- sentence structures changed. The way she arranges and the way she orders her subjects and predicates, those have changed. Everything has changed about her. Up until now, her sentences were shorter. They had words that were were almost monosyllabic, but now she has the, these really uh, larger, longer words, and her sentences are getting a little bit longer as well. Um, the multisyllabic words she's using are, are incredible for the amount of words she's using. This is this shows you how smart she is. She was, I'm sure she's read a whole lot as well. She's been well educated. There's a whole lot going on here, and she's really bothered. So she's pushed everything she's got up front to to start creating this protection around that uh, photo being fake. So she that's why her brain turns on. She's like, oh, I got to get into this. So she's using her all of her powers of education to help her do that. And she describes this picture she's trying to create in your head of that not happening. Um, I, 
and not only can we see her lying here, you can feel it. I mean, every woman there's, I got a thousand bucks. It says 95% of the women watching this will go, yep, I knew she was lying, knew she was lying because you can feel it because your brain sees the things that are telling you that, even though you don't know what those are, you can't explain and you may not know the specifics, but your brain sees those and goes, something's not right here. And I think that's what happened. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So let's talk about baseline. We started off by saying this is her new baseline. She's playing with her hair. She's grooming herself. She's doing all that. When things get hot, all that disappears. Her hands drop, as you said. Lots of other stuff happens as well. Up front, we always talk about, well, I, I have a note. I think her and Nancy Brophy have the same beliefs. I didn't believe it happened. So I didn't believe it happened. But she says a hell of a lot of words before she ever gets to, I didn't believe it happened. If that's your, if that is a way you typically define something didn't happen, you would say those words immediately. She doesn't. She rambles for a long time before she gets to it. There's no hard proclamation of innocence. There's a lot of disputing the evidence and attacking the teller. Little of denying. I didn't hear her say one time, I didn't do it. She finally said, I don't believe it happened. She does a couple of odd things. We talk about baseline. What is this suddenly? Back of the hand as an adapter to the side of her face. That's a deviation from everything we've seen to now. Why? Don't know. Don't understand. I would poke, drag her out across the coals and figure it out. Is it uncertainty? A lot of times we see people do things like that in uncertainty, but we don't know with her. We just know it's a deviation. And now she's adapting. She's got her hands in front of her face and she's washing her hands. Pontius Pilate, she's washing her hands of the act as she does it. Those are telling kinds of things when you don't do them otherwise. All that self-grooming is gone. All that self-grooming is gone. Now, when she talks about tramp, she does a downright eye access. And when we say downright, we typically associate, we're talking about the person's downright. We typically associate that with emotional recall. Now, could she be emotional about the fact she feels like they're lying? Certainly, but likely not the case because everything else is changing as well. And then back in the 18, I think 1870s, Duchesne and Darwin, for they said for, for sake of shortness, they would call this cluster of muscles right here the grief muscle. It's really five muscles that pull together. So they coined the term we use all the time. But that grief muscle, bam, pops out when she's talking about this action. First time we've seen it, when she's talking about disgusting food, when she's talking about being in prison, no grief muscle. Now we're talking about something hot, grief muscle. Lots of concern as she starts talking about he puked on her face and she has a nonsensical sentence. And Mark, to your point, this is a Harvard, grad, Harvard educated, I'm sorry, an Oxford educated woman. And she has grown up in a much different place than I have. I would expect her to be a little more articulate in there. And right as she says, that's the only time there's a brand new face. We haven't seen any of that expression up to now. All of this tells me that something is dramatically different in this than everything else we've seen in now. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I wish I could throw a hand grenade in and blow the, all of that out the water, but I just can't. It is a massive deviation from baseline. Those hands burying it and, and washing themselves. We haven't seen that before. Huge difference. Uh, all of her certainty, she does start off with, it's a fake. That's very certain. And then after that, it's just tempered and tempered and tempered with ideas of belief, uh, ideas of not as described, ideas um, that are that are clauses to it's 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 a fake or having no memory. So everything is degraded from it's a fake onwards. Well, you know when she speaks with such certainty with it's a fake, it would be great to kind of leave it there and go, oh well, that's fine. But she spends most of the time then undoing what she's put forward as the proposition. So that is is very, very odd. And it's all about doubting the victim. It's all about putting doubt at uh, in at the, I guess, you know, the, the main victim that we all know about that put uh, Epstein inside and, and really probably put her inside as well. Cast that doubt, why? Well, because she she's uh, looking at getting back into court and uh, and starting this this whole routine up again, uh, along with uh, Andrew, it would seem as well. There, that's all I got on that one. Let's see the next one. Oh, Greg's so serious. I'll give you that one, Greg. Bless uh, your heart. It's not serious. That's just uh, it was inanimate. Greg hey, exerted uh, minimal effort for that, <laughs> like I always do. <laughs> <laughs> What's a fake?
I don't believe that. I don't believe it's real for a second. In fact, I'm sure it's not. There's never been an original. And further, there's no photograph. And I've only ever seen a photocopy of it. I don't believe it happened. And um, it's certainly the way as described would have been impossible. I don't have any memory of going to Tramp. I'm certainly not in the outfit that I would have worn. Um, oh, her stories have changed so many times about what happens, when it happens, how it happens, with different versions. And each time she speaks, there's a different version. In fact, if you look at her BBC interview on the panorama, um, I believe she says that he, or I can't remember, either he or... Yeah, she that he puked on her face. That's the only time she's ever said that. I've read um, a lot of her deposition. And in her deposition, her statements are very categorical and her stories are very detailed and elaborate. If, if, if her memory is so poor, then how can you rely on anything that she said? Um, it's so, I don't know on which it is, whether her memory is so bad that you can't really credit anything she says, or it's more disingenuous than that. I can't obviously tell you which it is, only she knows definitively the answer to that. You know, and like I said, I think once you retract on two men that you make claims against on the grounds that your memory is faulty, uh, like I said, I think that, you know, you have to question everything that she says. Uh, Chase, what do you got? There's one thing you'll notice here. Galen is following a protocol to attack credibility based on memory. But her claims about not being at Tramp are all about remembering the event. So this is the case with dozens of her denials. They're all about memory. And there's a shift that takes place here in this audio. You'll hear it toward the end, but you're not meant to consciously hear it. Mark's been talking about this a couple of times. Its technical name is called a shift of referential index. And when we're talking about our experiences, we can make somebody else more likely to agree with us and align with our statement if we change the I to you. And you'll hear her telling you how to think about this situation in this audio here. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things only. Um, this is interesting because we're going to hear another video or another audio in a couple of minutes where we're listening to her tell a story. Very different cadence. Compare this to that will be the best part. But listen to that cadence shift as she's thinking and speaking. She should be freely going, but she's navigating what to say, in my opinion, here. She has a ton of time on her hands. It, look, if, if somebody locked me up and it was not because of something I had done, all I would think about is that person. And I would be able to spew language out like that. She's very careful. She's navigating language to make sure she picks the correct choice of words, to your point, Chase. Mark, even I think she doesn't say one because she has to appeal to average Americans who don't speak that way. I think it's intentional. And this is my opinion, like everything else we say. But when she's building this deposition, everything she says it here is key. So she's starting to attack the teller so she can now bring that up in court. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the witness, the victim, her deposition was categorical and detailed. Well, that sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, that's what you'd want is categorical and detailed evidence. And she has to throw doubt on that, just as you're suggesting there. Um, and so the doubt is, well, she retracted based on grounds of a faulty memory. Well, there's all kinds of reasons why somebody will retract. You know, they may be retract because the, the uh, legal weight that they'd be up against would be immense and therefore it just isn't worth your while uh getting into it There's all kinds of reasons all kinds of reasons and you might go look it's my memory rather than going it's because i don't want to play with that particular lawyer at this point because that particular lawyer is particularly litigious i don't know what lawyer i'm talking about by the way i don't know where i got <laughs> that I, I don't know what i'm thinking right now uh but you're right the rhythm is more is more broken and so we haven't seen that heard that breakup of rhythm before so she's being very careful about the words that she's choosing here um and and very careful about 
exactly how she's throwing these accusations of uh, and and doubts in there. That's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you, Mark. Her her uh, her wording is much more choppy. It's worse than mine. Mine's horrible. I'll talk and it just takes me forever to get things out because I got so many things running through it. But she's being careful about what she says. So that's what's happening there. And it's changed even more as far as the uh, as the way her structure goes. She's thinking about how to put this thing together. And we're hearing it as she's thinking about it. Her tone and volume are stronger. She's she's trying to sell this, but I'm not so sure it's working because of the way it sounds. I've read um, a lot of her deposition and in her deposition her statements are very categorical and her stories are very detailed and elaborate if, if, if her memory is so poor then how can you rely on anything that she says um, it's so i don't know on which it is whether her memory is so bad that you can't really credit anything she says or it's more disingenuous than that i can't obviously tell you which it is, and she knows definitively the answer to that. You know, and like I said, I think once you retract on two men that you make claims against on the grounds that your memory is faulty, uh, like I said, I think that, you know, you have to question everything that she says. I thought that the Queen was one of the most exceptional women I ever had the honour and privilege of briefly meeting. Um, and I think anybody of her stature, of the longevity of her reign, her elegance and her sheer capacity for um, dedication to her work and to her, um, to her job really was just astonishing. And it was one of the great privileges of my life to have the honor to meet her. She created a warmth and um, a um, and a sparkle in her eyes that was just mesmerizing, really. And uh, I shared uh, the story that we shared was about horses because I love horses and she loves horses, and so we talked about horses briefly. I remember and um, just shared a love of horses, and that was one of her great loves. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so Greg and I were laughing earlier uh, watching that because Greg said, well, AI could have written that. And I've got, yeah, this is like written by chat GPT. If you put in, like, how would you describe meeting the Queen? This is the generic answer that would come back at you. It's got all the branding pieces of, of Queen Elizabeth II in there. Um, you, and, and it's all about th this... There's a, there's, there's a narcissistic trait, which is um, associating yourself with people of high rank, essentially. And this is, I think, what's going on here. Uh, sharing that love of horses, sharing the conversation about, about horses. Yeah, we all know if you talk to the Queen about horses, she'd have something to say. We all know, like, I know that. Everybody, everybody knew that. Um, so there is there is nothing really very genuine and individual about this, any of the information that she gives here, totally generic and all about raising her up in the ranks in our estimation by associating herself with somebody who is now, you know, relatively speaking, fairly well loved and and respected. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree. And with the narcissistic statement there, I was surprised to hear her say that she met the queen briefly. I was su surprised she used the word briefly and not that it was a uh, an elongated event. Uh, and I'll just say one thing about this clip. When somebody compliments another person, pay very close attention. We tend to compliment the things we wish we had or the things that we want people to think are great about us. This is an unconscious reaction, which makes it a lot more reliable as a profiling tool. And if you want to try this, look on LinkedIn and look at somebody's profile. And instead of looking at the recommendations someone got from other people, look carefully for patterns that emerge when you read the recommendation they gave to other people. It's a lot more revealing than you might ever imagine. Scott. All right. 
The things I've been pointing out about her Oridian sentence structure are showing here even more. They're becoming more uh, evident. Her cadence has slowed down. Her words are, are more drawn out. Her tone is stronger. Her volume's up just a little bit, and her diction is improved. She wants to make sure everything she says comes across, across clear and clean. She wants you to know how she felt about the queen and meet her and what a wonderful person she was. She wants us to be as pure and clear and clean as she can possibly get it. So, so we know she's been there and, and she's showing the respect she has for the queen because that was probably the peak of her social arc there, but now she's down in the commode. So she's making sure that we all understand what a, that, that she understands how wonderful the queen was and how, what a good person uh, she was, and how she got along with her because she's that kind of, not because she's that kind of person too, but she understands that she can get along with anybody. And she's completely out of her baseline here for non-deception. Looks to me like, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, quite simply, same thing, Mark. Like we said, AI could have written this. This is all admiration for the queen. Of course, the queen has just died and is was beloved by most folks. And Mark, you can always find detractors no matter where you go. But the last thing you want to do is come across as somebody who is beating somebody who's beloved, number one. Number two, there's also those pictures of her and Kevin Spacey sitting on thrones. Probably not the smartest move she ever made. I mean, I'm not a British subject, but I would imagine that's not in good taste, number one. Uh, there are probably a few other things she needs to get out of the way. More importantly to me about this whole case, this is the way I expected her to speak when she was talking about the things that had gone wrong when she's talking in that last audio about Virginia Giffrey. Because here she is talking as if it's just a stream of consciousness. It is. She's just using words. Whereas in that other one, she's had years to think about this whole case. She would expect her to be as fluid, but she wasn't. She was navigating and tight. And you could hear her pausing between words as she's careful what to say, which means it was methodical. And it, in my opinion, was manipulative. Just my opinion. Right. <laughs> Got to give it to Mark. Yeah. He was first and he had his little classic pin spin. Yeah. Show us the pin spin, Mark. Oh, hang on. I've got it in. The... Hang on. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I wasn't ready shot, for dude. it. I'd already done I know. it. You already ready. Done That's it. the hang thing. On. I thought that the Queen was one of the most exceptional women I ever had the honor and privilege of briefly meeting. Um, and I think anybody of her stature, of the longevity of her reign, her elegance, and her sheer capacity for um, dedication to her work and to her, um, to her job, really, was just astonishing. And it was one of the great privileges of my life to have the honor to meet her. She created a warmth and um, a... Um, and a sparkle in her eyes that was just mesmerizing, really. And uh, I shared uh, the story that we shared was about horses because I love horses and she loves horses. And so we talked about horses briefly, I remember, and um, just shared a love of horses. And that was one of her great loves. Well, it's one of the most uh, interesting people I've ever met. He's was extremely sharp and interesting and has a broad range of knowledge on the world. I'll go first on this one. Um, this is really interesting because we're seeing stress we haven't seen before. And I think her limbic system just kicked into overdrive. And I think we're seeing adapters while we watch her struggle to create an answer. She's, she's talking about Bill Clinton. They just asked her about Bill, what he was like. And she's making sure every word is perfect. However, her diction, her clarity almost has, has completely disappeared. Everything starts getting smaller. She's being extremely careful with her words here. Her cadence has slowed down. Her voice tone sounds stressed. It's a little bit higher. And we haven't heard it this high or this stressed up to this point. She's trying to create an answer that has all the fluff and flowers that the one she gave for the queen has. She's trying to, to make 
Bill Clinton seem as, as high up and respectful as her, but she's having trouble because she knows she, she has to watch what she says and what she's talking about. The thing that really wigged me out on this, and that's why I was talking to you guys about it in, just before this, is because we're seeing cues of fear here. Fear, when she's talking about Bill Clinton. Everything has changed here. She starts talking more quietly. Again, she's back into that choppy thing, making sure everything, it's not choppy as it is thinking and then rethinking what she's getting ready to say because she's trying to make this good. She's afraid of Bill Clinton. We're seeing fear, that mouth open like it is. We see her, her breath rate grow up some. Her blink rate goes up. She has that burp when she does, when her head goes down. She's guarding her, her, her chin comes down, her head comes forward, she's guarding her throat. All these things indicate fear. And that's what we're, that, in my opinion, that's what we're seeing here. She's afraid of Bill Clinton for whatever reason that would be. And Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I don't know that I, I'm sure it's fear. I'm not sure it's not gastric response. She does it twice in this entire interview. But I do, look, she tried to use her relationship with Bill Clinton to get her sentence lightened. It's part of the show. They talk about it. So is it fear of him? Is it fear of what that will do? Is it something else? So there's a whole lot of stuff there, but I do clearly see chin drop, protect throat, grief muscle, and gastric response. Something's up there. Scott, you're dead on. Um, it's funny because everybody I know who's ever met Bill Clinton, including people who hate his politics, say the same thing, that he is just this most polished guy. And when you're in the room with him, everybody else disappears. He's just really good at people. He's the most charismatic person they've met. She's thinking clearly of exactly what to say, though. So I, I got, got to see where you're coming from, whether she's afraid of, whether she's afraid of how it's perceived or she's afraid of him. Don't know. But she is clearly when we talk about down left, you hear you'll hear us say internal voice we hear us talk about navigation just as a simple one for you i'm going to give you a way to do it and you'll see it in yourself figure out what eight and a half percent of your total income is you're first going to try to do some math tables from like third grade nine times nine is 81 that kind of thing it won't work so you'll have to go into some internal conversation and you'll sit and dwell on it for a few minutes and you'll watch your head drop your eyes go down into your left it happens with all of us it's about as close to an absolute as i know and you guys know how much of a non-absolutist i am She's back to that quirky, coy adopting style too, though, that kind of looking under her brow when she looks over. Maybe I, I'm going to give her the benefit of a doubt and say the burp and all that's just prison diet. Let's try, but something's up here. And all that internal voice is something. Don't know what it is, but that's what we see. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, Scott, uh, you nailed what I had here. All the fear around discussing the Clintons was a little scary, actually, yeah. watching the yeah. yeah. I thought about whether I was going to say anything or not. We tend to pe call people interesting when they make us feel interesting, which is a, an unusual thing in psychology. And I think we're seeing that here. But what we learned with this in last video and knowing that compliments are usually a desire to be seen the same way we compliment people. What what can we conclude here from watching this? Number one, she prioritizes being seen as interesting. But in her words, how does a person become interesting? They are sharp and they have a broad range of knowledge of the world. So if you're an interviewer hearing this, you're hearing information that can become a weapon if you decide to use it later to flatter them or make them feel good closer to getting to the confession stage of an interrogation or an interview. And we reveal a lot more in our language uh, than most people assume. So just like body language, Real language can still hide tons of information in plain sight or in plain hearing, I guess, in that case. Mark? Yeah, I think there is some hiding of information there, definitely. We, we get a, a face block uh, for sure. I mean, off, off uh, for, for away from where I think the entrance is, where other people might be able to, to see. I don't think she feels she's being listened to, but psychologically, it makes sense that there's there's some shading some hiding uh of of information here this this description of clinton is is as generic as the description of the queen but i think generic for a whole different reason i think there is a loss of fluency there so there's some editing that's going on along this and yeah we get this broad range of and then some some stomach gas discomfort there we see that later as well but we haven't seen it throughout and so yep it could be that this you know prison tofu is now suddenly you know wreaking 
havoc or just has been suggested maybe at that point there is some adrenaline that starts pushing its way through the system there is some some um discomfort there there is some uh fear going on i mean you know we'd have to be there and and ask to know for sure but it's certainly a possibility uh let's see what else uh we have and whether there's more fear involved that was smooth <laughs> that was very smooth well he's one of the most uh, interesting people i've ever met he's was extremely sharp and interesting and has a broad range of knowledge on the world. I say that the Epstein died and, and they should uh, take their and take their disappointment and upset out on the authorities that allowed that to happen and that as i said i i hope that they have some closure by the judicial process that took to place and i wish them um, time to heal and to be able to have a productive and good life going for, forward and that's what i hope for them and this is what she had to say when she was asked, if you win your appeal, do you think you'll be accepted again by the very people who were once your friends? Well, I can't know what my friends will, will do or won't do. I mean, my focus won't be on that. I will always turn to what I've now decided that will form the rest of my life, which is helping other people who are or have been incarcerated. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, guys, there is a grief muscle here, but not in the right places. Listen to her words, go back and listen to her words and look for where the emphasis should be. Most of the emphasis is on, hey, Epstein's dead. I'm not part of that. That's all over with. You should be okay. Epstein died and they should be upset with the people who allowed him to die, not the process, none of that. And then the whole court thing, all this stuff she says is with internal voice. Remember I told you about eight and a half percent of your income. It should be with emotion. If you're feeling any remorse, if you're feeling any sorrow for these people whose lives have been wrecked. Now, maybe she doesn't think they've been wrecked. Don't know. But her grief muscle engages this grief muscle, this arch right here, when she addresses time to heal and good life going forward. Hmm. Wonder why? I don't know. But we saw this grief muscle not associated with the gastric distress one time earlier when she was talking about being attacked by Virginia Giffrey and the photo. So the only two times we see the grief muscle without gastric distress is are these two pieces. It's every time she's attacked, there's a new adapter at her throat and even maybe at the supersternal notch, but also under her clothes adapting. Whatever she's saying there is very hard for her to say. She's trying to get something out. I don't see remorse. But I also realize there's a fine line to walk when you're admitting guilt or expressing sorrow. you got to be careful not to say, I'm sorry it happened because. If you do that, then when you get back, they're going to use it in court. So when she's asked about her friends is when we see the same exact thing that Clinton brought out in her. That gastric distress, that ducking of the chin, and that arch in the forehead. Does this mean that she perceives Clinton and the rest of her friends as having let her down? Or does she perceive that she's not going to be let back in or that the people that she relies on to get her out of this bind are not there? Likely, when you see two of the same thing, exactly the same thing, something's going on. I'll just leave it at that and say, Scott, what do you got? All right. This is where we're hearing true vocal, vocal fry for the first time. And she's, again, she's watching her words and she's being very careful here. And after a friend asks her the question or is, is talking, then we see her, like you were saying, Greg, she's guarding that reaction. She's breathing a little bit more heavily here. And I think she still hasn't come down from that Bill Clinton question. And I think that's why we're seeing all the all the little things that are firing off from that. I think it's very similar to that. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, just a big reaction on what they should do. The head reels back. I think there's a, a, a moment of disgust there as well. So um, really no uh, no empathy for uh, the, the victims in this case. In, in fact, you know, she does say they should take their disappointment out on the authorities that, are, that you know, perhaps allowed uh, the death of, of uh, her former partner. Um, so it's kind of that blame the government, not me kind of situation. It's all the authorities' fault. It's nothing to do with me. Uh, I agree there's that, um, that discomfort in the stomach again, that belch again uh, around helping and other people, this not needing friends now, and now she's going to help people who are wrongly in prison like her. So there's a, there's a narrative there. There's a piece of branding going on here that I don't need friends anymore. I'm now a crusader to help the victims of wrongful imprisonment, just like, uh, just like my, myself. Um, uh, let's all go and fight the system uh, together. Chase, what do you got on this one? I agree with you. And the, the whole time she's talking about becoming this pariah She's using internal dialogue, Greg, to your point, where there's either just recalling something she's memorized or written or coming up with words on the fly that sound good. That's when we see a lot of that eye movement. There's no emotion when talking about the people or the victims. The one time, which I think is the only time, we see her go into emotional eye movement, which is down and and to a person's right, is Right at this time, she's thinking about her friends at home and how will they respond. And I think this might tell us more about her behavior profile than a lot of other indicators we've seen so far. But in real life, we would need to ask her probably a few more questions to ensure that this is a a good hot point for her emotionally. But just with these available resources that we have, this is a big point for her. She gets emotional about how the friends will potentially react to her coming out. And that's all I got. I say that the Epstein died and, and they should uh, take the, the and take their disappointment and upset out on the authorities that allowed that to happen. And that, as I said, I, I hope that they have some closure by the judicial process that took to place. And I wish them um, time to heal and to be able to have a productive and good life going forward. And that's what I hope for them. And this is what she had to say when she was asked, if you win your appeal, do you think you'll be accepted again by the very people who were once your friends? Well, I can't know what my friends will will do or won't do. I mean, my focus won't be on that. I will always turn to what I've now decided that will form the rest of my life, which is helping other people who are or have been incarcerated. All right, Mark, what do you think we've seen so far? How's yeah, so been? even... Sorry, I cut you off. Go, go with that again. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll just say... All right. Mark, what do you think we've seen so far? Yeah, so even we've, though we've got somebody in incarceration and they're doing uh, behaviours we wouldn't normally expect, erratic, lots of self-soothing, notice that there are still those deviations from that baseline. We can still see when she's under even more stress, when she's being careful about what she's saying, and maybe as well when she's definitely holding back information from us. So that's really important. Uh, Chase, what have you seen so far? I think it's important. Let's not lose sight of what we're dealing with here. This woman strategically groomed very young women for abuse, girls, and she socially isolated them, then gradually normalized this behavior and then left them in this isolated circle so that that behavior was all that they saw and everywhere they looked. So it became extremely normalized. And in these videos, we're seeing a desperate attempt, I think, to appear wholesome and without any understanding of why she's been dragged into this. She's exposed uh, or expressed no remorse and no emotion about any of her actions that I've seen. And we continue to see that here. There's not 
uh, any remorse for the, for those people. So up, up till now, Greg, what have you seen? Yeah, interesting for me, I would call this how not to win friends and influence people. Number one, she fell from great height where she had no normal. What, what's normal for me and you, she never experienced, never. And now she's also not experiencing what is normal. So when she has to appeal and she has to appeal to normal people, she doesn't have a standard for that. And I don't think, I think that shows. I think she's among prisoners. Those are not everyday people. She was among the wealthy. Those are not everyday people. I mean, she met the queen. How many of you have met the queen? Maybe Mark. All that adapting and self-grooming gives us a baseline. And that's a good thing because, guys, we always say a baseline. If you have your finger up your nose all the time and you pull it out, it matters. Here's a good example of that. This is the equivalent of having your fingers up your nose and then pulling them out. Her grief muscle only shows up when she's talking about the Tramp Expedition and the overall what happened to these young girls, young women and girls. So those two things make me go, hmm, why does she have this grief muscle then? The only real emotion that we see any of the rest of the time appears to be around what her friends will do. She's declaring intent to help others. This is a new normal that she's trying to project so she can get to appeal. That's what I think. To now, what have you seen, Scott? I think we've seen a great example of someone who's gone from the highest of the high when it comes to social status. I think they, she's gone from the highest you can possibly go. We've seen all the behaviors that happen to a person that's done that, that is that has dropped down uh, to the very lowest of the lows. We've we've seen her go from always being pretty, always being able to to have what she wants and get what she wants, as all we as we all do, as being free people running around. But she can't do that anymore. She's got this strict, very mundane lifestyle now where she's institutionalized. She's not institutionalized yet, but she's well on her way, by the way, because um, of the people she's hanging out with or isn't hanging out with and the situation she's in. Because keep in mind, she's gone, and, and, and I think people really like, like they enjoy it from for some reason to see someone go from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows. Then this example, she's gone from, like you were saying, Greg, meeting the queen, hanging out with ex-presidents, meeting and hanging out with the most powerful people in the world, going on trips with them, uh, connecting with them, being friends with them, all the way down to about a quarter inch or a half inch, about a half inch from the bottom. All right. I think this is another good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?